So our lesson today is coming from, this evening is coming from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. We're looking at a, the third of our f- uh, four lessons here from the book of Malachi. Looking at what I'll call here a charge and a challenge from Malachi 3 verses 7 through 12. And I want to show this evening we can learn from the charge uh, that God places on the people and the challenges he offers or puts before them. If we're familiar, if you are familiar with this section of scripture, you know there are several things that are brought out. One being the idea of those who have turned aside, those who have robbed God, and also that challenge that is put out there before the people if they will return to him. So let's begin by looking at Malachi chapter 3, looking at verse 7. We have here this uh, first, our first main point you're looking at, you have turned aside, beginning in Malachi 3 and verse 7. Here the Bible says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And I'll split that verse in half there. Their rebellion has lasted generations. In the days of your fathers, the reference to the idea there being several generations, some take it back much further than that. But the idea there is very clear that they have been gone aside from God's commandments for a very long time. Uh, They had failed to see the error, and because they have failed to see the error of their ways, they have failed to change. He says, uh, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And I like that as we go through this, that when God discusses obedience and disobedience, there is no kind of, sort of, there is no a little bit, well, we once did. There's none of that. It's either they are obedient to God or that they're not. And we find here in verse 7, he says here, you have turned, you have, he says, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. I love that he says, and have not kept them. Because if he had just simply said, you have gone away from my ordinances, some might argue and say, well, see, they have, maybe they have strayed for a while, but God still is okay with them. That's not the idea at all. They have gone away from his ordinances, and he says, and have not kept them. They are unfaithful to God, here in verse 7. There is no, well, they once were, well, kind of, partly, it's no, they're not faithful to God. They have gone away from God's word. They have not kept them. God does not leave any room here for a, for a gray area or, or for excuses. It was either obedience or it was disobedience. And as you look at the latter part here at verse 7, he says, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord, Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? How many times have we seen that attitude in Malachi already? It began in chapter 1. What way or how have we done this? You know, if our child, if we go to our child and they argue with us by saying, well, what do you mean? How did I do that? I mean, we, what do we do? We don't change our mind. We say, well, let me explain to you what you've done. And well, here in verse 7, that's what they're doing yet again. But it's not the attitude of, of you know, they're den- that they are trying to figure out what they've done. It's the attitude of arrogance. They're denying it. They have done this, as a, as a previous section there said, for generations. They've done, done this for a long period of time. But notice also this first part of, or, or this latter part of verse 7, when he says, return to me and I will return to you. Notice how God is pictured here as having nothing to do with them. Because as we saw there in the first part of verse 7, they had gone, gone away from his ordinances, they have not kept them, and as a result, they have departed from him because you can't return to something you never left. So obviously they had departed from God. And he says, and I will return to you. But his returning, that, that, restore, that restoration of that fellowship with God was contingent and is based first upon their returning. They had to come back to God first. Before God ever allowed them to, to be restored and repentance and forgiveness to take place, they had to return to him. But instead, their response here in verse 7 is, But you said, in what way shall we return? God's return to them was conditional on their return. God's distance was because 
of their sin, like we saw last week in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Sin separates man from God. God's promise of blessings, like we're going to see more of later, has always been conditional. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 28, just, as, just for one example. Man, man must cooperate by doing his part, and they have not done this. In what way shall we return? That's their response, and it's lack, it lacked heart, desire, loyalty, or anything that resembled the desire to truly turn from evil. It wasn't a true desire. In what way shall we return? Or really, we, we see this, we said already, it's, it's insincere. What way have we done this? What way have we done, th done that and transgressed? What, should we, what way shall we return? You know, we think about those that we talk to who are not members of the church, those who are non-Christians, uh, those who maybe are even a part of any re religious group, to use that terminology when we think about denominations. And you talk to them about sin and bring up different things and you, and you get to talking about what it means to come back to God. You know, there are those today, I know this will be shocking, who think that God asks too much for our return, that his demands are too high. And we find this question here, what way shall we return? The way that God has required everyone else before them and everyone else after them to return by godly sorrow that brought about repentance. We find next in verses 8 and 9, this heading, you have robbed me because they have robbed God. Now we're going to look at what he gives here, the, the exact charge against them, but I think there's much more to it than just what, what the Bible mentions here. Because there's also the, the mindset and the, the attitude, the heart behind it. If you look at Malachi chapter 3, looking at verse 8, we have a rhetorical question that's asked, and as you have there on the screen, a gut-wrenching answer. They say, he asked the question, will a man rob God? That's the rhetorical question. That means you ask it, knowing the answer is. Yet you have robbed me. But you say, what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now we understand this is Old Testament version of what they gave, how they gave back to God. But the idea is very clear. They were not giving God what was due to him. You think about that question for just a moment. The very idea that God has to ask that question to these individuals shows you the state in which they were in. Will a man rob God? Now, if we were in that position and God was speaking to us for this sake of our lesson this evening, and he was asked, if he asked us that question, will a man rob God? One of the things we might think of first is, why is God even asking that question? Because they were robbing God. And it's much more than just their tithes and their offerings. They weren't giving God the time. They weren't giving God their attention. They weren't giving God their loyalty to Him. As we saw back in verse 7, they weren't following after His commandments. They had gone away. Yet He says here, You have robbed me. But you say, again, their response, In what way? In what way have we done this? And he tells them how. We think about for us today, applying this to us today, can we ever, are there times that we could honestly say that we have robbed God of things that he deserves from us? That we have not given him the time that is, he is worthy of? That we have not given him the dedication that he is worthy of? That we have not made him the priority that he is? And the list goes on and on and on. But again, verse 8, they had robbed God. Looking now at verse 9, <clears throat> he says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, why are they cursed? Now, we could say they were cursed for all the things they have done previously to this and building up to this, but that could be part of it. But included here, he says, word for word, for you have robbed me. They have not given to God what is due to him. And he puts in, he includes the whole nation. He says, even this whole nation, which means no one is free from this curse. Because they have not been given to God, given to God what is due to him. They are cursed because of their actions. And no doubt, as we saw previously in verse 8, <clears throat> their words match their actions when they say, in what way have we robbed you? 
by asking that question to try and deny it. They're saying, we haven't done this. Show me where we've done this. People don't, don't do that today, do they? There's nothing wrong with that. Tell me where the Bible says I can't do this. People do that all the time. And God doesn't change his mind at all. He still curses them in verse 9 because of their actions. Nothing changes. They kind of pout like children, and God still curses them anyway. It doesn't change his mind. Then we find in verses 10 through 12, if they will return, what's going to happen? In Malachi 3, beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 12. In verse 10, we have a sincere exhortation and challenge. In verse 10... He says here, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That is, bring me everything that is due to me. Bring it all in, hold nothing back. He says that there may be food in my house. And now try me in this. There's the challenge. He says, test me if I will not provide for you. Says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings, there will not be room enough to receive it. He says, give me what is due to me, and I will pour out blessings to you. You want to have room to even place it somewhere. But that was conditional, wasn't it? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That was the first thing. Give me what is due to me. And again, I think it goes much further than just the the physical offerings they were to give to God. It was about returning to Him. Turning back to His Word. Turning back to His commandments, to His statutes, to all those things. Which would lead them to bring the tithes they, they were to bring into the storehouse. And when they did those things, in verse 10, there is something He said that would take place. But He issues this challenge. He says, and try me now in this. Which means, do this and see if I will not do the following. And what is it? If I will not open for you the windows of heaven. You know, there's another time that that phrase is used. The one that comes to my mind, maybe there's just only one other, maybe there's more, I don't know. But I think about during the time of Noah. Do you remember when the flood began, or when the rain began to open, or come down, the Bible says, and, and the windows of heaven were opened? Talking about the downpour of rain just pour, coming up on the earth. That torrential downpour, a little glimpse of what we heard a little bit ago. And that's how he uses it to describe the blessings that will come from him. The windows of heaven will be open, and they'll just pour down blessings upon them. He says, there will not be room enough to receive it. You won't have any place to put all those things which God has blessed you with. But they had to come back to him first, as we see there in verse 10. <clears throat> In verses 11 and 12, we find, again, really more continual blessings as he's going to punish his, their enemies. He's going to, to revive their blessings from, that, they, that had been previously taken away from them. And he, he would even bless them publicly. Looking at verse 11, he says, Now I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Some say that's a reference to locusts there. Whatever it may be, whatever insect or whatever pestilence may have been that was devouring it, he, would, he says he would rebuke them and he will bring it to an end. Nor should the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field. You know, by God saying this, he's, he is pointing out that the reason these things are taking place is because he has caused it. And he has caused it because they have turned away from him. And so all these things that are happening that's going to be, come to an end for a good reason, that's going to be to their good, is because it's going to be contingent upon them coming back to God. So the devourer has, he has been devoured their, the fruit of their ground, has come, that's been going on. Why? Because they've been unfaithful to God, and God caused it to happen. The vine has failed to bear fruit in the field. Why? Because they've been unfaithful to God, and God caused it to happen. But he would bring those things to an end, as he says there in verse 11. Verse 12, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And so God will bless them, and they will be fruitful, verse 11, and they will be blessed to the degree that those around them will see it. You know, we think about <clears throat> how different individuals and different nations even in the Bible have been blessed to the degree that others have taken notice. 
I think one of the best examples of that and someone taking notice is Job because Satan took notice of how much God had blessed him. That's why he asked, that's why he said, you know, have you not built a hedge around him? Because he sees how God has blessed him. It was to such a degree that everyone else noticed. And here in verse 12 he says, for you will be called, for you will be a delightful land. All nations will call you blessed there in verse 12. Why? Because of the Lord. Not because something that they have done that has caused this to happen. They just suddenly become outstanding farmers and workers of the vineyard. No, it would happen because they returned to God. And God, in verse 11, would keep the promises made there and all those other promises as well concerning their return back to Him. Everything hinged upon their return to God. And we think about this this evening. Everything that is good that we have, the Bible tells us, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from, from above from the follow lights from whom there is no shadow or, 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 or turning. And we think about how in Malachi 3, those good gifts, they are promised, they are conditioned upon their return, come directly from God. You know, you think about just those five verses, 7 through 12 there, Malachi 3, God has clearly punished them already, was going to put a curse upon them because of their robbing, robbing of him, but he promised that they would come back to him, that he would, he would bless them as he had before. So everything that we have in this life that is good is a blessing from God. And sometimes we realize that even also the hardships that we face that make us stronger, the things we endured, that we survive and push through to the end, those two are a blessing from God. It may not feel like it at the time, and oftentimes it doesn't, but they are a blessing from God. Some lessons for us today. The first one is you cannot argue with God. You know, throughout Malachi, we're not done with it yet, we find that statement, in what way have we done this? Or what way shall we return if we find here in, in verse 7? And what they're trying to do is to argue with God and, and to really many times argue they have not done any sin whatsoever. In what way have we robbed you? That's an argument. We haven't done this. Show us where we've done this. And he does. Tithes and offerings, right? In Malachi, man is pictured in many instances as arguing with God. Again, that phrase, in what way? is used throughout the book, indicating an attempt to argue with God. But God's charge never changed, not once. You cannot convince God to approve, to approve, I should say approve, your disapproved behavior. God does not change based upon us being unhappy. He does not say, okay, your disapproved behavior is now approved of because you're so unhappy and you're arguing with me. You know, God is the, he's called father for a reason because he's the best father of all. He doesn't change. He calls wickedness, wickedness, no matter who he's talking to. He calls sin, sin, no matter who it is, no matter how many people are doing it. You think about that during Noah's time, how many people were doing evil, and God still said, you know what, I don't care how many people are doing it, it's still sin, and you're still going to die for it. He does not change. When Noah was on the ark, and, his, and that, those eight people there, including Noah, on the ark, and the rain descended and the world was condemned for their actions. By Noah being on that ark and his, and his family. And all those outside dying because of their rebellion. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of things that stuck in Noah's mind. But one thing is that God doesn't care if people are doing wrong. He doesn't change wrong to right. Numbers of the wrong never convinces God that it's suddenly okay. Because it's not. And here in Malachi, the same idea. God never changed, not once. You cannot convince God to approve your disapproved behavior. And secondly, man must do his part. When we're talking about being faithful to God and receiving blessings from God and coming back to God, we have to do our part. If you remember in Acts 2 and verse 37, when those individuals had heard the preaching of uh, Peter on the day of Pentecost, and they ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're acknowledging there's something that they have to do to correct their situation, to make atonement, 
for their situation. That was obedience to God, obedience to the gospel, that included forgiveness and repentance of sins, and then baptism, which would wash away those sins. That was their part. Their part was acting. God's part was what? Allowing that blood to flow and to wash away their sins. God always takes care of the faithful, but you must be faithful. If we're honest, there's a lot of people today who have a very poor idea about what it means to be faithful to God. I'm convinced, and I don't think I'm alone, there are those who are not here today and may not be back for a long time who are convinced that they are faithful to God. But friends, the Bible would disagree with them. We have to be those who are brave enough to say, you know what, the Bible says this is what faithfulness is. And if that's not what you're doing, then you cannot be faithful. Because that's what the Bible finds as faithfulness. Loyalty to God. Repentance when we make mistakes. Coming back to God. But so many times we fail when it comes to both of those things. Loyalty to God and repentance when we do make mistakes. You cannot, just like you cannot drive without gasoline, you cannot have blessings from God without consistent obedience. You cannot have blessings from God without consistence, consistent obedience. You think about how many things come to an end because of inconsistency. Faithfulness in any area of life, if it's not consistent, things change, doesn't it? If you're not faithful to your employer doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're not consistently faithful to them, what's going to happen? When I say faithful to them, I mean doing your job, showing up on time, those types of things, being drug free, whatever it may be. What happens? You're probably going to lose your job, and rightfully so. If we're not consistently faithful to God, what's going to happen? When we say consistent, we mean that we're going to make mistakes, but hey, we correct it. But if we're not consistent to God, and our faithfulness to him, we're not going to have heaven as our home. We think about Malachi chapter 3. We have to ask that question, have you gone away from his word? Going back to verse 7, he says, From the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances, and have not kept them. That was their sin as he begins that section. You have gone away from my word. Which led them to doing what? To robbing God to questioning God, to arguing with God, and then being separated from God, right? It all begins with getting away from the Bible. You know, for a lot of people today, the Bible isn't a very exciting book. I think, really, if we're honest, it's because we don't give it a fair chance. We didn't think about the amount of time we spend doing other things and the amount of time we spend reading and studying God's Word, oftentimes it doesn't get its fair shape, so to speak. It's hard to compete with 10 minutes of the Bible with four hours of television, isn't it? It's hard to compete with four hours of, you know, of, of 10 minutes of the Bible and four hours of something else, or four hours of something else. But we need to give the Bible its fair chance because it's not only interesting, but it literally has the words of eternal life. Are you robbing God? And again, we're not talking, I'm not talking about financially here, per se, as we look at this idea. But we can rob God in many, many ways. We can rob Him by not giving Him our time. We can rob Him by not making Him our priority, which means we don't give Him much time. We can rob Him by saying, well, I'm okay. We can rob him by redefining terms and deciding we're faithful when we're really not. And on and on that list goes. But if we are robbing God, we can never have heaven as our home. You cannot be doing God wrongly and then go to heaven as if you were doing God correctly and following him. This evening, as you think about these things, you think about Malachi chapter 3, verses 7 through 12. Again, only five verses, but much for us to consider. Did we find, where do we find ourselves in that section? Are we, going, are we going away from God's word? Are we robbing God in some way? And if we are doing any of those things, are we willing and ready to return to him and have those blessings restored? 
Because wherever sin is mentioned in the Bible, there's always the solution mentioned as well and the blessings that come as a result of following that solution through. So this evening, as you think about these things, if we can help you or encourage you in any way, we'd be glad to do so. That's good if we stand and sing the song that's been selected.